Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series. This is the fourth webinar in our five, or the third webinar in our five part webinar series Decolonial Perspectives on the Psychological Study of Social Issues. I'm Sarah Mancall. I'm the Policy Director for the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. We're also known as SPISI. And today's webinar and this entire webinar series is organized by the Reed Sura Decolonial Editorial Collective. Today's webinar is entitled The Colonial Col Coloniality of Knowledge in Hegemonic Psychology, Part One, Rigor or Rigor Mortis. We are going to be posting this webinar along with all other webinars on SPISI's YouTube channel, which you can find at www.youtube.com backslash SPISI. And you can find all of the materials related to this webinar, including all of the peer reviewed papers that were published in the two special issues of the Journal of Social Issues at www.spissy.org backslash decolonial perspectives. I'm going to type all of that into the chat today so you can find everything. And if you want to follow today's conversation, you can follow hashtag ReadSura2022. That's hashtag R-E-A-D-S-U-R-A 2022. And now I'm going to turn things over to our convener and discussant for the day, Glenn Adams from the ReadSura Decolonial Editorial Collective, who is also a professor of psychology at the University of Kansas. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for the introduction. And thank you to Spissy for ho hosting the webinar. Um, I have the great fortune to work on this project as a member of the Reed Sturrad Decolonial Editorial Collective. And I've asked my colleagues to make themselves visible while I introduce them. Uh, Gita Reddy of the Open University in the UK, Kapano Ratele of Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and Shanaz Safla who is at uh, the University of South Africa and the South Africa Medical Research Council. And today it's my turn to represent the collective as a convener and discussant for today's session. If, if you've joined the webinars today, well, if you haven't joined the webinars, uh, you can do so as Sarah has noted because Spissy has recorded them and put them, made them available on their YouTube channel. But if you have joined the webinars today, then you'll know that the first two installments of the series consider the psychology of colonial violence. As we say in the abstract for the series, a key idea of decolonial approaches uh, is that colonial violence is not confined to the distant past, for example, colonialism, or the ongoing occupation of land, but instead persists as the occupation of being via coloniality, which are you can think of as racialized views or ways of thinking and being that have their roots in colonial violence, are inherent in the Eurocentric modern order and are inseparable from modern individualist development. An important implication of this coloniality idea is that colonial violence extends beyond physical space to psychological space, such that complete liberation requires forms of psychological decolonization. Today's installment of the webinar series shifts the focus of analysis. Rather than apply the disciplinary lens of psychology to understand and respond to forms of colonial violence, the remaining presentations in the series turn the analytic lens to in interrogate the coloniality of knowledge and hegemonic psychology itself. Again, as we say in the abstract for the series, researchers aren't innocent bystanders who observe effects of colonial violence from some neutral position. Instead, the business of psychology proceeds from a Eurocentric modern slash colonial conceptual foundation that affords various forms of epistemic violence. The presentations today set us on our way by illuminating and responding to different manifestations of epistemic violence or the coloniality of knowledge in psychology itself. So with that, we'll move to the, the first presentation, which is by Joshua Oyheng, who will be uh, presenting work uh, based on an article that he wrote with Christina Montiel uh, with, on the title or with the title Foundations for a Decolonial Big Data Psychology. So please take it away, Josh. Thank you, Sarah. 
Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and thank you to the Reedsera Reed Editorial Collective for organizing this event. I hope you can all hear me and see my slides. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to open today's session on using uh, with this paper on foundations for decolonial big data psychology. My name is Joshua Oihang, and I'm here to represent myself and my co-author, Dr. Christina Montiel uh, uh, of the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. So today's uh, talk will be about four things, one of them being the promises and pitfalls of big data psychology, the fo some foundations for potential decolonial big data research, practical examples of these principles, and some synthesis and call to action. I find it important to delineate that this talk is also not about a comprehensive review of all forms of decoloniality in relation to big data or psychology, but rather we want to emphasize the necessarily situated and polycentric nature of decoloni decolonization processes in this area. Um, and it's also not a blanket rejection of big data from psychology but rather we posit the crucial participation of marginalized collectives um, in big data discourse within and beyond psychology. So uh, I think acknowledging right, uh, our positions is also crucial in laying out these ideas. Both um, Tina and I are born, raised, and trained in psychology in the Philippines. And so that informs our particular approach both to big data and to psychology and the ways that they converse. Um, we also um, occupy privileged subjects, uh, uh, subject positions as middle class scholars within the country. So it's a highly economically stratified um, country with its own um, post colonial legacies. And our middle class position offers us specific material resources with which we're able to engage these discourses. But it also does, um, you know, shape our experience in a way that doesn't necessarily reflect that of the broad majority of the uh, country's population. Um, Tina, in particular, um, her views are shaped by decades of peace scholarship and activism in the context of democratic transition and peace building. So in the transition of the Philippines from an authoritarian regime to its present form, um, sort of democracy, <laughs> um, and myself as a digital native with more interdisciplinary computational and social science training at, at a Global North institution. So we think of both these commonalities and these differences as um, important context for understanding um, the kinds of ideas I will be describing in this presentation and potentially to explain um, things that we're um, going to miss, right, as a result of our um, particular positions. So the context of this work um, is really that there is an increasing uptake of big data methods in psychology research. And this uptake is typically seen in terms of the um, unquestioned benefits of increased volume, velocity, veracity, and value of um, data around human behavior, cognitive processes. Many of these are often thought of in terms of social media, but there's also so many other sources of large, large, amounts of data that um, psychologists are increasingly using in their work to understand um, human behavior, cognitive processes, the typical um, domains of study within uh, psychological disciplines. Uh, however, we noticed that um, in many approaches that seek to integrate big data methods um, into psychology, um, there's a predominantly technical and skills-based approach to um, to, to this integration. So we see a lot of papers that try to talk about how to essentially use the technical um, skills of big data methods usually drawn from uh, computer science or engineering and applying them in a rather uh, static, unchanged way um, into psychology um, to ask and answer uh, questions that psychology would already be asking. Um, and so, Within these um, uh, processes, we notice that there's a systematic treatment of big data as an otherwise neutral tool, method, and window into generic human behavior. So um, I think jumping off of some of the important definitions that Glenn just laid out at the beginning of this session, we view these, um, you know, these advances um, through the lens of modernity coloniality. Uh, which we define in the paper, um, drawing on a lot of the Reed Sura Collective's work actually, um, as an interrelationship of present social arrangements with the pervasive effects of historical subjugation, spanning legacies beyond literal um, territorial subjugation. And so decoloniality, um, in our view, 
uh, can be understood in terms of these three R processes um, that we try to uh, integrate into a big data psychology that could potentially incorporate decolonial potentials. So processes of, re processes of recognition, resistance, and renewal amid and against the contexts of modernity coloniality. Uh, we also specifically locate our perspective within Global South with an S, so Global Souths. So embracing um, this notion of the Global South not as just a literal um, singular geographical monolith, but rather um, potentially a collection of plural contexts of power differentials that go beyond uh, fixed regions in space. And so when we apply these concepts to our what we're noticing as these developments in incorporating big data into psychology, we see that um, essentially there's a reproduction of these two key trends that already occur within psychology and big data. And when you put them together, um, they kind of multiply, right? Like these issues kind of multiply. So um, in a lot of critiques of psychology that come from a decolonial perspective, we see that there's often a generic view of individuals. So using scientific discourses to normalize um, the so-called weird subjectivities. And in contrast, the scientific exoticization or pathologization of Southern subjectivities. Similarly, in a lot of existing big data domains, there's a treatment of large sets of data points as computationally equivalent, uh, and the decontextualization of data sets from wider societal conditions. So these are uh, these have more to do with how, um, say, social media data or other big data sources are often treated. So they, when you put these two ideas together, um, the generic view of individuals um, in both big data and psychology can be magnified. Similarly, we notice that there's a detached view of researchers in um, psychology as critique from a decolonial perspective. So this typically discounts researcher relationships with human populations and erases the wider practices which govern psychological knowledge production, including norms of analysis um, and power relations embedded in the scholarly publication process. At the same time, with big data, the view is often, oh, because we have so much more data, it's going to be objective. So it discounts research relationships with um, the big data practices that are, by definition, not actually very objective at all, but rely on many subjective decisions. So this erases also the wider conditions which nest the even the capacity to collect big data, to store it, to manage it, analyze it, and transmit it. So what we propose in this paper is essentially um, alternative ways of potentially thinking about the ways how big data and psychology can converse with each other. Um, and we try to think of that transition from a data processing to knowledge production standpoint. So typically, um, a lot of the papers that try to get big data and psychology to talk to each other um, just focus on how to collect massive amounts of data. So this is how you use this particular string of code to collect millions of tweets. Um, but we want to think about ways that instead, how do, you, how do you engage the settings that produce the data? Second is how to use code to handle large quantities of data. How do you um, shape it and morph it into ways that can fit into the typical, um, maybe experimental analysis? And, how to, and, and what we propose instead is to think about how to handle the data so that it respects um, those that it quote unquote represents. Third, um, many of the methods, again, also just really think about um, existing concerns over precise and generalizable statistical patterns. Uh, and what we propose is to situate these data questions within their wider contexts. So the way we think about these um, general directions, right, to transition from data processing to knowledge production is in terms of these four pillars, ontology, epistemology, ethics, and reflexivity. So ontology being what is the phenomenon that's being studied from a big data psychology lens? How do I know it? How should I engage it? And where are the researchers in all of this? And I specifically used two case studies from the Philippine context where we tried to illustrate these principles, of course, still in quite imperfect forms, but we hope that these um, attempts signal ways that big data and psychology can converse um, in a way that incorporates decolonial principles. So we have, as our first study, this text analytical study of religious dehumanization in the context of conflict between Muslims and Christians in the Philippines, where Muslims um, are historically the minoritized religious population in the country. 
And the second study is another text analytical study of collective emotions during political change. So um, with the rise of our of a populist president, um, Duterte, who wished to um, change the constitution in the Philippines, how emotions emerged in relation to that move. So in terms of ontology, uh, I, I will draw on the first example of the religious conflict uh, study. And what we propose is that in big data uh, psychology, that the thought process shift from aggregated individuals to situated collectives. So here in the study, what we tried to do was not think of Muslims and Christians in general, as in some kind of reified um, universal population, but we situated them within their particular cultural and historical context in the Philippines. Um, and so this decentered this conception of population as if it could represent anything beyond um, what we were actually studying. So um, when we thought of Muslims, we specifically, you know, didn't just use um, that single religious marker, but intersected it with their particular, uh, with the Muslim people's uh, particular history uh, in the Philippines. So how they've been, um, have, how they've been systematically erased from Philippine history. Um, and so the specific discourses that we were examining uh, took that uh, took those factors into consideration. And so this doesn't apply at all to uh, Muslims and Christians that go beyond the Philippines, although more um, other principles might be drawn that um, could potentially uh, apply. Um, second, from an epistemological standpoint, also drawing from study one, a shift from laboratory control to societal naturalism. So here the idea was in collecting the big data surrounding the conversation between Muslims and Christians, not to focus on surveys or lab manipulation, but how the, these populations were already talking to each other um, in the naturalistic setting of online conversations. And what was important was that we studied the discourse as they were uttered in their local and emergent fashion. So we didn't have like preset statements that we asked for ratings with agreement or disagreement, but we used the utterances directly. Um, and what was interesting was um, it, as part of the research, or as we were trying to get this study published, um, one of the reviewers pointed out that there was a big discrepancy between um, statements that were classified as dehumanization by um, the Christians in the study versus those that were um, Muslims. And so that became interesting because from a big data standpoint, that would have been seen as a flaw in the study. Um, but it became actually part of the major insights in the paper where um, for Christians, maybe dehumanization is not as evident um, because, it, because they occupy the majority um, within the social structure. Third, from an ethical standpoint, I now draw on study two, where again, we collected all this data on um, conversations about uh, the political change that Duterte wanted to implement. And what was really interesting here is that um, in typical big data fashion, the main ethical question is around privacy. But what we saw um, in our experience of this study was um, the state wanted to fund our study um, and requested for monthly updates on what we were seeing in the online conversation. And this was really interesting because this really went beyond a, a, a privacy concern from an individual standpoint and came to encompass more political kinds of ethical questions. So if we're studying how people are reacting to this political change and we're reporting that to the state that wants to implement it, uh, what does that mean for you know, the research process? Um, there was also a lot of questions. Um, there were also a lot of questions around how much of the discourse could be seen as legitimate as opposed to potentially manipulated by the state's disinformation machinery. Um, and finally, how we actually reported these findings back. Um, we eventually decided to uh, nix the state funding, even though it was going to be a lot, because we uh, feared that it was going to become a way to surveil um, populations that wish to dissent against the political change. And instead, um, a lot of the public uh, post-publication processes involve gathering community members, members of uh, the clergy, activism groups to report the findings to them, rather than to uh, the rather than to the state. And then, from a reflexivity standpoint, um, given that the political change would have such unequal impacts across the archipelago, we actually made sure that the entire study involved. Um, this politically sensitive collaboration of multiple identities that would be differentially affected by the um, by the political change. And this also became embedded into the way we developed 
um, any of the computational tools. So, um, so instead of you know treating like random people who would tag texts, um, we made sure that the uh, unequal, unequally positioned identities were all uh, represented in the study. So I think I have a minute left. So I, I just want to conclude with some of these broader principles. Um, where we hope that a decolonial perspective of big data psychology can advance data agency, not just of the global South knowers, so in this case, us who occupy the scientist position, but also the known, uh, so the, the people that are being studied through these lenses. We also um, propose the importance of data accountability, so the transparency of boundaries, limits, and engagement with big data, so not claiming that they unlock these universal truths about people devoid of context, but rather show um, ways that uh, their uh, views can be both situated and limited. And finally, the need for more data democratization in a way that is uh, equitable between North-South collaborations. So many people or many conversations about big data try to make it more um, uh, available for research purposes. But in many cases, a lot of these collaborations tend to be extractive rather than genuinely empowering. So. I just want to conclude with this, um, yeah, so <laughs> slide full of other resources that do discuss these issues in and outside of psychology. And I thank you for your time. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Should I just stop sharing or? Yeah, yes, I guess. Um, okay, thank yeah, you. Join me, please join me in, uh, yeah, expressing appreciation for that uh, amazing presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we are going to switch the uh, listed order a little bit. We're um, going to move now to uh, Fuad Buzanadin, who is going to be uh, presenting on behalf of his uh, collaborators, um, Reem Saab, Barbara Lastikova, Anna Kende, and Aaron Ayanian, on a, uh, who we're co-authors on the article and uh, that he's going to discuss today. Titled, Some Interesting, Some Uninteresting Data from a Faraway Country, Inequity and Coloniality in International Social Psychological Publication. Take it away. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry for the nasal tone, I'm a little bit, uh, I have a little bit of a cold today, but I'll do my best. Um, so to begin with, uh, I I'll talk a little bit uh, about the background in terms of the literature on Northern privileges in academia. Uh, research has long shown the presence of Anglophone academic hegemony and intellectual imperialism. But the thing is that systems of knowledge production interact with this and with variations and effects of different global systems like globalization, neoliberalization, patriarchy, uh, STEM field obsession that's driven by you know, the growth economy um, and other related factors that are um, related to political, economic, and sociocultural factors. Um, our paper uh, incorporated a mixed method survey of social psychologists from a large number of countries. We asked people for their thoughts about the disciplinary standards for what makes a good international social psychologist and asked them later on to reflect on a number of aspects of publication and conduct of research such as their own or their compatriots' experiences with reviewers, editors, collaborators, and their ways of working in the profession more broadly. So uh, researchers outside the global North acknowledged the, the, the mo modern standards in the discipline in much the same ways as those in the North did, but they simultaneously rejected the Northern Anglophone consensus and emphasis on things like impact factor, um, or language uh, of publication as the sole acceptable standards, emphasizing the importance of both local languages and journals and of collaboration to a greater extent than did Northern scholars. They also reported lower interest, non-Northern scholars also reported lower interest and lower proportions of publication in international journals. This lower interest and participation in international publication could be forms of psychological and everyday resistance to intellectual imperialism. But alternatively, this pattern could reflect consciousness among non-Northern scholars of difficulties and inequities in their capacity to publish internationally or even to access international publications. 
So you can see here, these quotes show uh, are some examples of the resistance to evaluating research by impact factor, general rank or language, and to the very idea that publication itself is the best determinant or marker of scholarly success. These kinds of rejections of contemporary standards coexisted with acknowledgements that these standards lead to inequitable outcomes across a variety of social and professional dimensions, while at the same time acknowledging that there is really not uh, any clear way of avoiding um, complying with these standards. For example, these quotes show awareness of double standards and biases against research conducted outside the West in publication outcomes. So this critical reflection on the international publication system extended to a somewhat lesser degree to Northern scholars as well, especially those outside the, the Anglosphere. So whether it's in Italy or Finland or Switzerland, there were complaints about the hegemony of Anglophone and particularly American psychology, norms and practices. So social psychologists outside the global North uh, generally reported that they feel pressured to abide by norms and disciplinary standards that are set by the North, but these seem to be harder for them to meet than for scholars in the North. There are systemic obstacles that affect the ability of social psychologists outside the global North to be represented in the international literature, to, en to engage in international publication, to find relevant literature for their context in that literature, and for their work to be equally valued in that literature. So these, some of these things included that they mentioned were institutionalized scientific, scientific mimicry, as Martin Barreau had um, uh, called it. Uh, so in a large majority of institutions in the global south, there were requirements for publication in specific kinds of English um, and high tier, high impact journals, um, which essentially enforced this kind of mimicry across countries. Uh, there was underrepresentation that they reported. So uh, a lot of their, the work from their, um, from their context was not ending up published in the international literature and could not um, due to issues uh, around collaboration, around ignorance, around biases and double standards from reviewers, editors, readers, and uh, even and citers of their work. They found that the international literature was less relevant for their context and that uh, topics that were locally salient seemed to be less globally valued, whereas it did not work the same way the other way around, where the, the topics that were highly valued in the global north uh, tended to be uh, also valued in, in outside that global region. And there were trade-offs as well in terms of the practical coping strategies that they used. So some of them reported uh, using sort of hybridized ways of working that uh, increased the burden on them. So trying to publish, for example, in both local and international Q1 journals, so a kind of parallel track uh, to, to remain tied to the local while trying to remain relevant to the, the international or uh, internationalizing their work uh, completely and, and training working or publishing in the North only using Northern standards, or on the other hand, going the other way and indigenizing their work and training, working or publishing indigenously using indigenous standards. So overall, what we found was uh, that there were two concurrent processes going on in the responses that we obtained, uh, whether qualitative or quantitative. Non-Northern scholars rejected these Northern standards to a greater extent, but their institutions, governments, journals, funders, editors, and reviewers enforced compliance anyway. The Northern standards disadvantaged non-Northern researchers to a greater extent, but lacked compensatory mechanisms to ameliorate this inequity. Prejudices and biases intersected with these processes so that they affected the most disadvantaged most. So for example, early careers, women, lower ranked institutions, non-white, non-Anglophone, unfunded, critical theorists, those operating in unstable, poor, politically or norm normatively repressed contexts, um, all reported having much more difficulty dealing with these, uh, with these issues. One way with that, that we saw this was in uh, the license that and power and incentive uh, 
balance that they had to challenge these kinds of standards. So we saw that non-Northern younger participants and females, for example, were less likely to see um, uh, local and regional publishing as a sufficient standard for recognition at the international level. So there was a, a privilege that uh, older male um, non-Northern scholars had in, see, in being able to publish more locally and, and, and to, to see that as sufficient that others did not did not have. In terms of collaboration as well, we found that it was compensatory uh, a mechanism for disadvantaged scholars, whereas it was more extractive for advantaged scholars. So female researchers, especially outside the North, were more likely to select collaborating internationally as a criterion for international recognition, um, especially, uh, yeah, and especially outside the North, uh, whereas the opposite was true for, for male scholars. In terms of uh, training, uh, Northern training seemed to be quite effective at shifting these standards. So Southern participants trained in the South were more likely than any others to believe that publishing in local and regional journals was sufficient. Non-Northern participants who trained in the North were more interested in international publication. Um, and non-Northern participants trained in the North were less likely to believe that collaborating internationally was sufficient to be a good international research uh, researcher. This is particularly, particularly problematic because of the continued uh, policies that governments and uh, institutions have been uh, pursuing, um, leading to brain drain across uh, national borders, uh, the increased uh, establishment of satellite campuses of um, university in, uh, of northern universities in uh, the global south and as well um, uh, southern countries and institutions uh, recruiting heavily uh, northern scholars to teach in their universities as well so we found that non-northern scholars disadvantages were not reducible to simply to cultural differences, developing world problems or national wealth disc discrepancies. Our colleagues reiterated what the literature and the science of knowledge production has argued that modern academic systems advantage is for high volume, labor intensive, fast, high cost and decontextualized research with Western samples in English. For those conducting research in other ways, they were caught in a double bind between collective systemic disadvantages and lack of effective and professionally viable alternatives. According to our respondents, disciplinary systems and standards were amplifying linguistic and scientific hegemonies and pre-existing intersectional social hierarchies. They're exacerbating exclusion, inequality, and homogeny across intersections of nation, epistemology, career stage, gender, status, age, politics, wealth, and centrality. We found preliminary evidence that rather than internalizing these disadvantages standards, most disadvantaged scholars, especially in the global South and Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, held critical or ambivalent views of the uh, discipline systems and standards, and many felt coerced to comply with them regardless. So this suggested that the most sustainable course of action for reform in the discipline or the most effective or impactful would be to enhance efficacy and availability um, in establishing alternative systems and alternative ways of work. Uh, so the main question I want to ask today is what would help increase efficacy and in action against inequities within and beyond the field? We can think of individual, collective, structural, societal, and international possibilities as some of our respondents, respondents suggested. So for example, um, one uh, respondent from Finland uh, suggested uh, one mechanism which she used, um, which was publishing her most important work in low impact journals that were more um, accessible across the, the globe and that um, uh, were more available and, 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 and um, used more uh, inclusive criteria. Um, a different uh, approach in terms of collective actions would be institutional or national industry strikes that were mentioned. Um, the Elsevier boycott that is ongoing. Um, if you haven't heard of this, check out the cost of knowledge.com. Um, structural kinds of policies or, um, or, or actions. So for example, enforcing local language education, uh, indigenizing training and hiring when possible, uh, 
um, and multilingual journals and, and um, research outlets. So uh, as an example, one of our respondents from um, Qatar mentioned that their particular institution had um, banned uh, teaching in English um, and, and uh, even uh, when using reading material from um, in English um, had to um, translate that uh, for the students and uh, situate it within the um, the origins of that uh, of that uh, work. Um, in terms of societal actions, in terms of participation, relevance, utility, value, and the norms in the science and its outputs, there would seem to uh, be a greater um, calls for wider engagement in attenuating hierarchies within and across countries and increasing participatory processes in professional, social, economic, and political systems. Internationally as well, there seem to be uh, a great demand for solidarities across borders within and outside the profession. And finally, I want to thank my brilliant collaborators on this project who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today. Anna Kande, Barbara Lastikova, Rim Saab, and Arin Ayanya. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> join me in uh, thanking Vlad for that, another remarkable presentation, um, showing your appreciation. Thank you very much. And now we will move without uh, further delay to our final presentation for this session by Mona Abduzena, who will be presenting work and an article that she did with uh, Jacqueline Mattis and Keith Jones uh, with the title, Dismantling the Master's House, Decolonizing Rigor in Psychological Scholarship. Thank you, Glenn, and to the, um, the Decolonial Editorial Collective and everybody who is here today, the other presenters and who might be joining in the future. Um, I wanna start by noticing that I am not streaming my video and sharing this quote from Audre Lorde, um, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare. For people with privileged identities, self-care is generally celebrated. For others, including myself, it may be considered indulgent or considered skeptically because it violates implicit norms. Here I am at a professional webinar opting to keep my camera off. I've intentionally set a boundary of not streaming video as a form of self and community care and in solidarity with students and others for whom video streaming inhibits our full participation. Critical groups widely agree that professional standards of dress and presentation often perpetuate hegemony. So please reconsider with me that people may be fully present with their cameras off. I also want to recognize that however we're participating and for my co-authors and I, Keith Jones and Jacqueline Mattis, we do embody uh, settler uh, settlerism in U.S. lands, and many of us are gathering or presenting from, in, from unceded indigenous, indigenous lands. So I wanted to acknowledge the uh, past, present, and future custodians of the land and talk about the impacts of colonization, genocide, and forced removal. Um, I know this is often considered somewhat performative, but we consider it an act of disruption in order to be able to move um, to move towards troubling uh, and reconstructing some of the perspectives that we have. So we start our paper with a quote and even the title uh, echoes and invokes Audre Lorde's metaphor of the master's house. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, thinking about the intractable nature of oppression and how colonialism narratively reframes and frames experiences of indigenous and enslaved people. And today we will trouble the tool of rigor in psychological sciences. Um, so moving from big data to a story that we also consider very believable and important data, um, our paper starts with a story of a student, a student of mine who is a biracial uh, student and an insightful double majoring undergraduate. Um, I happened to meet him the semester he was returning for medical leave. He approached me because he wanted to write an honors thesis, but we recognized that his grades were just a bit shy uh, of the minimum grade point average. So grades GPA is somewhat an accurate measure supposedly of, of academic achievement. 
We developed a plan for him to ask for an additional semester to bring his grades up, but our proposal for the honors thesis was denied. Uh, he was ineligible just because of the GPA. We appealed that decision and I reiterated the equity-based factors that his declining grades corresponded exactly with his documented medical leave. Um, and it was replied to me that this is a rigorous department, we have standards. Um, I specified that the goal was not to lower the standards, but just to uh, offer a little bit more time to accommodate his circumstances. Again, the, uh, the appeal was denied. He ended up receiving honors in a second major. Um, I want to trouble the cost to him to be excluded and to have to go through this entire process and everybody else who was, who was part of this, and how this uncritical claim to rigor also excluded the field from any potential contributions that he would make. So I'm just curious, I won't be able to monitor the chat very well, but for folks on the call, when you think about rigor in psychological science, what is the synonym or what are the words that sort of come up for you? Um, and oftentimes our definitions come with these Western ideas about what Western science establishes as consensus uh, around knowledge or truth. The word often traces back to French words related to strength and hardness, um, numbness, stiffness, firmness. Uh, within the context of Western science, it presumes truth procedures that are precise, that are exact, that are uh, developed through consensus and somehow objective and accurate. When we went back, however, to look at the definitions of rigor, we found other, a, a sort of another branch of the definition of rigor. And this branch focused instead on a very different meaning about being stretched, uh, about being flexible. So the idea that here you would need some sort of sway for these large formidable structures like skyscrapers or tea, trees to be able to sway in order to maintain their embodiment over time and space. So there's a way that these topics in terms of the stiffness sort of hang together that we found and we've heard from some of our other presenters, but we want to highlight sort of how we presented it in our paper. Um, the idea of objectivity where scientists center a zero point epistemology within Western science, uh, this colonial knowledge thinks about the detached or objective observer who's discovering knowledge. The effect of such is a centering that deflects attention from human or subhuman actors or people considered subhuman and their standards and standpoints. Uncritical claims to rigor delegitimize other frames of knowledge within Western and US dominated psychological scientists, sciences. This is linked closely to issues of replicability and fungibility. So given objective notions of truth, some psychological researchers develop measures that are supposed to be valid across a range of participants and contexts, demonstrating their reliability and trustworthiness based almost entirely on their replicability. So replicability of findings naturalizes the fungibility of participants, of researchers, of contexts. So in order to replicate findings, researchers essentially need to ignore or treat as fungible the context and identities of participants. Finally, because of this, there's this notion of generalizability. Replicable social, social science findings are considered valuable when they represent truths that can be generalized or universalized beyond a particular niche sample, which reinforces the niche ends up being a, a sort of focus on the weirdness of science, uh, the whiteness of science. So drawing from this quote from Jeff Arnett, such narrowness in research psychology cannot be justified by the requirements of science. On the contrary, no other science proceeds with such a narrow range of study. It's difficult to imagine that biologists, for example, would study a highly unusual 5% of the world's crocodile population and assume the features of that 5% to be universal. Yet in studying human beings whose environmental, economic, and cultural differences make them more diverse than any other species, that is what American psychologists do. So because in the doing of this, we end up with different levels of erasures, erasing emic perspectives. This is not an, an insignificant task, but it ends up instantiating violence, contributing to the scientist feeling of being undone. It's not just a harsh review when people hear this or a rigorous review, it's a dismissal of one's lived experience. 
This contributes to the isolation and marginalization of scholars and prospective scholars. In order to survive academically, people often need to unknow, as Geisler talks about, their own lived experiences and the experiences that tend to be marginalized or, or, or within knowledge schemes. Eraser, erasure in this form of knowledge production reproduces habits of mind and scholarship that are associated with individualism and become a manifestation of coloniality in terms of knowledge and being. And finally, erasure includes observing processes and lack of obscuring processes and constructs, even if they are import, because their existence may be outside what is considered normative in psychological science. It doesn't link back to the previous scholarship and literature. I'll turn it over now to my co-author, Dr. Mattis. Thank you, Mona. So one of the ways that we have tried to um, think about how we intervene in this very particularized and very problematic way of understanding what rigor is, um, the kind of rigor that is, uh, is, is more connected to this, I, this notion of firmness and universality that is really deeply problematic, is to ask students and to ask ourselves, what if we started with a heartbeat? What if we started not with um, literature, but go back to the lived experience of the people whose lives we are interested in and the phenomena that we, that um, have drawn us to um, this the, the kind of inquiry that we do. And this is a quest, this is a, a request that I make in particular of the students with whom I'm working. So when we're talking about constructs and they're talking about literatures, I will say, who do you know who is implicated in this thing. So if you're doing a study on self-esteem or spirituality, talk with me about a spiritual person. Talk with me about people in your community who live out these phenomena in their everyday life and then put the pit their lives in context. So to get back to this notion that um, if we're going to study lived experience with all of its beautiful messiness, we've got to deal with the messiness. The erasure of the messiness means erasing, erasing the humanity and the complexity of who we are. So part of the getting back to a different kind of rigor requires us to start with a heartbeat. So we've talked about the ways in which rigor has been problematic in, in its formulation and in the way that we've operationalized um, rigor historically. So from our perspective and the, the way that we take rigor up in the paper, we, we lean into that second definition of um, what rigor means in terms of its roots. And that, that notion of rigor requires us to think about rigor as getting its strength from its flexibility. So whereas in much of the way that we think about the social sciences and the way that we are taught to do our work, we tend to think of flexibility and nuance and playing in the messiness of humanity as a source of threat. So we ask that we actually lean into that flexibility by doing the following, attending to context, particularly sociopolitical historical context, the context of the genderedness and embodiedness of the, the people whose lives we're studying. So we've got to recontextualize and deeply contextualize the, the people and the phenomena that we are interested in. We've got to lean into lived experience and all of the complexities of that. Uh, we've got to recognize that there are multiple ways that people know. So in our, our manuscript, we talk about, for example, intuition and the ways in which intuition or embodied ways of knowing have come to, come to be seen with suspicion and erased in the context of um, what we pay attention to as legitimate text. And so, but doing so means that a major part of what all of us do as human beings is being eliminated from our epistemological work. We lean into a definition of rigor that attends to intersectional approaches to epistemology, right? So that's situating people in, again, the, the multiplicities, not only of their identities, but those identities as contextualized in histories, in structures um, that people operate in. And being able to sort of think about if you're studying spirituality or self-esteem or whatever it might be, those things don't live 
the outside of a context of the multiplicities of our identities and the structures in which we have operated and histories out of which we've operated. So how do we bring those, those connections back in? Um, we've got to pay attention to positionality, our own as researchers, and do it not in, again, the kind of performative ways that we increasingly see positionality and reflexivity um, being done in research, but we've really got to not allow ourselves to be challenged by our participants, challenged by the communities whose work we're, who, whose lives we're writing about, but we've also got to do that, that meaningful work of understanding why are we asking these questions? questions. How, what are we not asking? How are we implicated in the work? How are we affected by the work and affecting the work? The work has got to resonate with the participants and the communities whose lives um, we are representing. We've got to take up issues of power in meaningful ways, and we must do the work that we're doing in a way that centers the dignity of our participants and, our, and, and the communities from which they come a sense of hopefulness, radical care and compassion and justice and love. So as we talked in doing the, the manuscript, one of the things that we talked about was the, the real importance of being able to ask people about their lives, but also think about what questions would be asked and what data would be gathered if we were gathering, gathering data and asking questions of people who loved our participants. And not just people who are interested in their lives, but who deeply loved and respected um, and held their dignity. And then finally, we've got to begin to think in more expansive ways about what constitutes legitimate text for the study of psychology. So surveys and, and interviews are certainly part of that, but there are other meaningful texts, murals that people compose as a part of the work of um, doing justice in their communities. The 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 um, witness where that people have. So there are multiple texts that we can can study, can use to do our work, and we've got to make sure that we're doing that. So with that, we're um, open to questions, comments, um, reflections. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, uh, join me in um, thanking and uh, showing appreciation for the, pres the particular presentation. Uh, we will now move into the next portion of the session, which will involve uh, questions and answers. So thanks, first of all, to all the speakers for the presentations. If you do have questions, please share them in the question and answer function of Zoom. And while you're formulating your questions and while my colleagues are curating your questions, I'll just take an opportunity to share a few remarks that I think um, to me kind of pull out some of the main ideas uh, across the presentations and put them in the context of the broader series. So to, to do that, I'm gonna uh, do a bit of sharing of my own screen for a bit of presentation. So um, the presentations today and de decolonial perspectives more generally remind us that psychology is not simply a steady march toward enlightenment and progress, but also as a site of epistemic violence. And simply put, epistemic violence refers to the ways in which standard methods of knowledge production and, re and resulting knowledge products can cause harm. Typical instances of epistemic violence involve intellectual imperialism or the imposition of knowledge based on research in Western, educated, industrial, rich, and supposedly dem democratic, or in a word, weird settings as a hegemonic standard for humanity in general. And one way that imperialist imposition of weird knowledge causes harm is epistemic exclusion, the displacement silencing or rendering invisible of local or indigenous knowledge forms. The form of epistemic violence has received increasing attention in recent years. And one prominent spicy example is the work of Isis Settles, Nicole Buchanan and their colleagues, such as this current project that uh, just won a spicy award under the lead of Martinique Jones. 
The presentation in the article by Fouad and his colleagues does an excellent job of illuminating some of those processes by which this epistemic exclusion occurs. Another way that imperialist imposition causes harm is mismatch or low cultural fit between hegemonic knowledge forms and local realities. Simply put, knowledge and practices that make sense in weird settings may be problematic when exported to various majority world communities. In relatively benign cases where the imposition of weird knowledge has little impact on local experience, this harm can be limited to a waste of scarce resources on ineffective interventions. But in more harmful cases, the imposition of weird knowledge can expose people to outcomes that are less optimal or more detrimental than they would otherwise experience. While epistemic exclusion and cultural mismatch happen when scientists and practitioners import weird science into majority world settings without regard for local knowledge, epistemic extractivism happens when scientists take an interest in local knowledge as a resource that's ripe for their exploitation. And again, I think um, Fouad's presentation illuminated some of these processes of uh, uh, appropriation and extractivism. In typical cases, researchers sitting comfortably in centers of the Eurocentric modern order contract with collaborators in majority world settings to collect samples of data. They remove these samples of data for analysis outside the context of the research, and then they publish the results with literal, little or no involvement of their majority world colleagues. One problem with such extraction, of course, is unfairness or injustice, whereby researchers are appropriating valuable information resources but without due recognition of their local colleagues or without contri contributions to the local research capacity. But this injustice is also a more, or beyond this injustice, I suppose I should say, is a more conceptual harm that's related to epistemic distance because the analysis interpretation of data often happen far from the settings in which the researcher extracted them. This epistemic distance increases the likelihood that the researcher who is working in isolation from uh, local collaborators will interpret results in ways that misrepresent majority world experience. And such instances of misrepresentation, misrepresentation often constitute what Thomas Teo has referred to as epistemological violence. And he defines this as the interpretation of empirical results in ways that implicitly or explicitly construct the other as inferior or problematic, despite the fact that alternative interpretations equally viable based on the data are available. An obvious expression of epistemological violence within psychology is scientific racism, which is the relatively conscious deployment of scientific methods and authority to legitimize racial violence and to lend credence to myths of white supremacy. But beyond explicitly racist forms of explanation, more common and perhaps more insidious forms of this epistemological violence in any account of group difference concern what um, uh, Peter Hegarty and his colleagues refer to as the construction of the other as uh, the effect to be explained or the effect that requires explanation. This focus not only affords a construction of deviation from weird patterns as deviance or pathological failure to conform to weird normative standards, but it also promotes a construction of weird patterns as a default baseline of just natural tendencies that don't require explanation because they're descriptively and prescriptively normative. From this perspective, an important decolonial move is to denaturalize the whiteness of hegemonic accounts by interrogating them from epistemic perspectives of majority world settings, as my uh, colleague put it in the title of his book, to, to, to think about how the world looks from those particular locations, in his case, thinking about it from an African epistemic standpoint. The view from this standpoint permits a peek under the table to reveal the typically obscured colonial scaffolding necessary to support the supposedly natural modern individualist tendencies and their associated prescriptions. From this perspective, the epistemic violence of weird psychology is not just about the neocolonial imposition of Eurocentric particulars, but also about the coloniality inherent in those, mod those, those modern individuals particulars themselves. And we understand this elevation of modern colonial ways of knowing and being as the primary expression of the coloniality of knowledge. 
You might think of that in psychology as methods and practices that reflect and actively reproduce modern colonial individualist life ways. And one way this surfaces uh, is evident in some of the things that uh, Mona and Jackie were discussing in their presentation, and especially this idea of zero point epistemology, a kind of uh, methodological abstraction uh, from context to some supposed view from nowhere that's evident in the kind of domination of weird standards, as they noted, but also as they, they write in the paper, laboratory experimentation and uh, value, value neutrality. Another manifestation of this coloniality of knowledge is uh, an individualist ontology and the uh, paper by Josh and his collaborator, uh, Christina Montiel, um, really give a, an excellent uh, illustration of this idea and how the, uh, the, frame, the, the individualist ontology of the field uh, distorts collective phenomena and in ways that are problematic uh, uh, and constitute coloniality of knowledge. And finally, a presentation that we did not have in this session, but was in the previous session, illustrated this idea in terms of thinking about neoliberal growth orientation, how modern uh, uh, individualist, mo modern colonial individualist life ways uh, come to inform what we think of as just natural and true in ways that can, can cause harm. By portraying individualist life ways as natural standards, psychology, uh, science and practice obscure the modern colonial foundations of these life ways. They promote ignorance about the harmful consequences of these life ways. They constrain imagination of more sustainable alternatives, and they contribute to some of the same social issues that people uh, in this room and on this call are seeking to address. The remaining two sessions of the webinar will continue this focus on the coloniality of knowledge and psychology, attending specifically to disciplinary decadence of hegemonic psychology and um, moving towards strategies for a decolonial refusal of hegemonic psychology. So I will uh, stop the sharing and um, turn it over to my colleagues to direct the questions. Hello, Glenn. Um, do you mean with Sorayes? Yes, please. All right. Um, thank you. Um, there are seven questions in the Q&A. Some are comments, um, but I think uh, for you, uh, Mona, and I think you've begun to answer some in the chat um, and also begin to um, share how you are reframing um, some of what you have been critiquing, but there are very specific questions in the in the Q and A that you might want to look at, and if I may direct you to that. And Josh, um, Joshua, the very first question, of course, was directed to you, uh, I believe, which was asking you to elaborate on the kinds of interventions um, that you see possible for for what you talked about. So I wonder if we could start uh, again. I wonder if we could start with Joshua. Um, and that will give Mona um, and Jacqueline a chance to look at the questions directed, directed specifically at them. Thank you. Yeah, and I should note, I think that question uh, that came in, uh, the, the writer, the author of the question also intended that for Fawad's presentation too. And, and maybe uh, while everyone is thinking about that question, I'll just throw another question in that's for everyone um, to think about if they wish to address it. You know, recently the field has, uh, the field especially of social psychology, but throughout the field of psychology, there's been, and especially in North American psychology or Northern psychology, there has been a move to reform the field, to improve its knowledge practices because of uh, flaws that people saw in its knowledge practices. So I would be interested to know how you see uh, your work uh, sitting vis-a-vis -vis the kind of move to reform uh, the, the methods of the field, uh, how those, whether those moves are, um, you see them moving toward the kind of things you're talking about today, or if they're maybe even moving away from or misguided in some way vis-a-vis -vis what we've been discussing today. But um, please go ahead and address uh, questions either Fuad or uh, Josh. Thank you, Joshua. Um, 
Yeah, I think I did see that question come in during Fuad's presentation. So maybe Fuad, you'd like to uh, give it a go. <laughs> it was an, in a, it was addressing the problems that you your work had raised. So what interventions you see for them? Yeah. So uh, thanks for the question and, and thanks everybody for the, the great presentations. Uh, as for what interventions, this is kind of what I was hoping to have a discussion, a little bit of a discussion about today. Um, I mean, we are, my, my collaborators and I are working on sort of uh, ideas for um, how to approach these problems. Uh, the, the issue though, um, and, and this also maybe perhaps speaks to um, Glenn's question as well, is that uh, what we see is that a lot of these problems are entangled uh, and, and really inseparable from each other um, across not just the, the professional practices and norms, but beyond that into um, you know, the social hierarchies, the, politi the politics, uh, domestic or international uh, that, is, um, that are um, involved in the, the political economy of the, of the discipline that are involved in um, sort of the working conditions for academics that are involved in um, the prejudices and biases and, and assumptions that are um, pervasive uh, within and, and beyond uh, the scientific community. Uh, so in our perspective, it's not sufficient to, um, to talk about uh, disciplinary reform without also talking about um, societal action and societal change um, at the same time, because trying to do one without the other uh, is, in our view, uh, going to be insufficient or unsustainable. Um, in the in the in the medium and long term, uh, because these kinds of um, hierarchical dynamics tend to reproduce themselves over time, even when you put in counterbalancing or, or uh, remedial kinds of mechanisms to ensure that they don't happen. Uh, so this is why I mentioned uh, not just individual or collective kinds of interventions when um, we when I talk briefly about some kinds of solutions, but also societal and, and international kinds of um, uh, action that uh, have to be ongoing um, at the same time. And the question of whether what our role as academics is going to be in those kinds of actions, um, it, it is the answer to that is probably, you know, um, individual to the person um, uh, engaging with, with these issues. So some people I know like um, are not comfortable uh, with the, the, the scholar activist uh, kind of role. Uh, and some people are comfortable with being an activist as a scholar. Uh, and some people are, are more comfortable um, being both a scholar and an activist. Uh, but the point is that there has to be some effort to expand our solidarities, uh, not just within um, and across our silos within our profession, but, but beyond our profession as well. Josh, I think if you have an answer, you can, to, in the context of your own presentation, I think the question applies equally to you. So um, if, if I'll pose it to you. And I Sure. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with um, everything that Fuad has said. Maybe a lot of my answers will be in terms of specifying um, how a number of these principles of expanding solidarities apply um, specifically to attempts to do interdisciplinary work um, between the more computational big data people and um, you know more traditional uh, psycho people who work within psychology. And maybe this will... Um, maybe this will also address one of the questions I've seen down the line where I think it was actually addressed to, let's see, I think it was really addressed to Mona um, and, but yeah, so but where, where they were asking, can um, new definitions of rigor entail only qualitative studies? I would be curious to know what, um, you know, what, what they think as well, but um, at least from our standpoint, we draw on um, concepts from Fanon and uh, that were recently elaborated on by um, Maldonado, Maldonado Torres, where they where they think of 
um, decolonizing methods, at least in the social sciences and psychology, less about specifically just qualitative or you know the divide between specific method types, but the decolonial attitude that's embedded in the practice of these methods. And so the kinds of interventions we propose in our paper um, actually does hopefully try to envision some quantitative practice where <clears throat> uh, where decoloniality is enabled and, and ways that we've been thinking about that um, include, for example, um, really deepening um, what is meant by, let's say, diversifying our samples. Um, I really liked that, uh, that concept from the last presentation about beginning with a heartbeat. Right, I think in many in many cases, um, diversifying samples um, can, if not done carefully or if not done in a way that actually embodies some relationship with the people that are you know quote unquote being studied or in which these people, uh, in which different peoples do not even participate really in terms of the active role of researcher, um, the diversity becomes tokenistic rather than. Um, genuinely relational and participatory. So I think um, there are ways to incorporate these principles um, within, you know, quote unquote, quantitative methods where um, you go beyond just ticking some boxes <laughs> of like, oh, I have more diverse samples or, you know, um, I'm using uh, more diverse measures or things like that. So really deepening um, uh, the critical engagement with um, various populations, not just as objects of study where you want to tick some boxes, but actually um, uh, the, the concepts we use in our paper are to um, advance the agency of these populations within the study and to enhance researchers' accountability to these populations um, in their work. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I want to hop in about this question about qualitative and quantitative, um, and I definitely am very interested in hearing Jackie's perspective, but um, I want to start with, with saying that in terms of another intervention, being a part of a community of practice, of research practice, research practice, practice, praxis, all of these areas like the um, like the like the collective help to embody helps us learn more about our own biases and assumptions and sort of think about how we can rethink things. Um, in conversation with Jackie, um, you can say a little bit more about the student who was forced to study the self um, and and how that was really challenging. But I know in our conversations, it made me rethink what Glenn was discussing about, like what are the sort of kind of things that we assume to be natural. Um, so I study human development from, you know, we talk about, you know, lifespan. And I thought, well, how have I been conditioned even in my own scholarship to dismiss and erase part of my own worldview or the worldview that many others participate in, which includes a pre-life, includes an afterlife. So when in all of these ideas about, you know, pre and post-life or afterlife or reincarnated life, they affect our choices within this worldly life in a very sort of um, concrete way. So I think opening things up for sort of changing and having dialogue that helps us change some of our constructs themselves and how we try to measure them. So that would be one suggestion um, or one intervention. But even I'm interested also in religion and spirituality. And so within Islam and many other traditions, there's a, an issue of ritual impurity. And this is not something that is usually studied in the literature because there are no analogs in terms of the, the dominant researchers. So sometimes those qualitative studies can help us identify something that doesn't necessarily have an analog or that shows up in a different manner. And then in that sort of process, we have this back and forth iterative relationship between qualitative, quantitative, between other types of methodologies. Um, so I'll pause there. Also, I'm not really sure if the things we answer show up to other people in the Q&A. So, so to um, build on um, the points that have, have uh, come up before, it, it, I'll, I'll first start with the um, request from Mona to talk a little bit about the student um, who I had in a uh, seminar class who was from a cultural framework where uh, the notion of the self does not at all exist for her 
cultural group in the way that it does in the United States. Like that's that notion of self doesn't really exist. And so she was doing a, a particular study and the her her advisor told her that she had to include particular constructs because those are the constructs that have been defined as necessary for a sort of fully realized uh, quantitative model. And this is not a critique of quantitative research, but one of the things that she and I talked about was, what does it mean to include constructs in a study of members of your community? She was going um, home to um, to, to her country to, to do the, the, her dissertation research, what does it mean to include constructs that you know don't have any meaning to people who are part of your community? And, it, and so often we are forced into developing models to study communities that are rooted in literatures that were never designed to contemplate the people who we're trying to understand. Um, so the, it, to... Um, this and again, this is not a critique of quantitative research because we can do qualitative research badly too, right? So the the goal isn't to elevate one form of research over another, but to really think about in everything that we're doing, how do we in using sort of a citizen science kind of model where communities are really deeply engaged with us in understanding helping to shape what we define as the constructs of interest. So even when we study things that we think we understand like happiness, that construct doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. And so how do we begin to think about how to define the constructs that we're interested in in a way that is that matches the lived experience of the communities that we're um, interested in learning about? How do we not make individual people, um, if you are the only person of Chinese descent in a class, how do we not make you the expert in that culture so that you don't like your particularized understanding of the culture doesn't have to stand for everybody's right how do we do the kind of background work to understand how we how do we do cultural work right which we have to do with every human um so there there are there are strategies that we need in the work that we do in order to make sure that we're defining things well, that we are understanding the lived experience of, of, of constructs as they exist, not just for individuals in um, graduate school or the individual faculty member, but for the community. Um, we There are other disciplines that have begun to do more, some of this work, Anthropolo there are feminist anthropologists and cultural anthropologists who have been it, doing this kind of work for a while. And while, they're continuing to struggle with how to do this. And we all will over time, right? There will be, we'll never get it fully right. But our, our goal is to try to be as right as possible, given the questions and, and um, analyses that are available to us. So it's a very long answer to say, um, qualitative, we don't solve these problems by going qualitative. Um, we, we, we arc towards solutions by shifting the questions we're asking and shifting the methodologies that we're using and by becoming humble in ways that we absolutely are not as scientists right now. Thank you for those uh, answers to the questions. We have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, and I'm going to, to read the ones that I see. Um, my uh, read, sir, read, sir colleagues can also jump in here if they wish. Um, one uh, question is, as we consider rigor, I'm reminded of ableist discourses, and this is from Tom, Thomas Durth, Remain reminder of ableist discourses within psychology about who can serve as a researcher, a questioner, asker, and interpreter of our findings. I'm wondering how you see decolonizing rigor to be directed to how we can care more for trainees and expand what is a valid representation of our work. So maybe this is some of the things that people have um, uh, addressed to some extent. Um, if you care to comment on that. Uh, another couple questions have to do um, with how the approaches relate to the field of critical psychology or any other kind of critical discipline. And um, if uh, you could provide any reflection on how the topics present today relate to, uh, quote, the universal declaration for ethical principles for psychologists, or more generally, I think, ethics and research and the contrast between 
um, maybe conventional conceptions of, of ethics or hegemonic conceptions of ethics, if you want to, to, to think of it that way, and the perspectives that we're discussing today. If I can comment on um, uh, on Thomas's question, and then there was an earlier question that sort of, for me, uh, connects to the the really important question that Thomas asked, um, and that, that that question is a question around essentially the value of diversifying the fields and whether you know the the diversification of our fields will help solve these problems and i and my the way that i think about this and again for me this goes to thomas's point as well there is some there there's tremendous value in making sure that we have different perspectives always in a room but i think one of the things that we always have to be attentive to is the ways in which the um institutions that are not interested in meaningful change will assume a magical uh, answer to the, the challenges that we're talking about by just bringing different colors, cultures, and abilities into a room, but doing nothing to sort of shake up the way that we do our work. So, um, and I think this is part of what, um, I, I imagine that this is part of what Thomas was, was highlighting, um, that I think we've got to, to understand that even when there are people of different identities in a room, which there are, are increasingly are, people from given communities also internalize really problematic ideas, even about their own communities, right? So I am, um, I am a Black person who I know I have lived in spaces where I have to consciously undo ideas about what it means to be Black that have been taught in classrooms by people who are sometimes Black and sometimes not. The literature I'm reading that presumes that to be Black means to be poor and to be poor means to be at risk and that means to be problematic. We all are steeped in these narratives so much that in order to be able to shift the discourse, we've we've got to do unpacking. So we're not, we don't solve the problem just through numerical diversity diversity, we've got to take seriously the idea that we have to unpack the, the ideas that we've socialized all of us into. We've got to recognize that there, there are real skills. We don't solve the problems through skin color or through, you know, um, sexualities and, and again, diversifying around those identities. There are real skills attached to unpacking these ideas. There are real competencies attached to the ana analytic work, the development of new measures from an emic perspective where you actually get communities involved in helping to, um, to frame out the questions that will help you get at the constructs. Um, and we need new theories and new epistemo epistemological frameworks. So there's real scientific work that can be done around and needs to be done. It won't be solved through numerical diversity alone. Thank you for that uh, response. Other responses? I call it, Jackie, the Benetton ad effect. Like, you know, you have to actually have an opportunity to, sh to change or decolonize the thinking and the approach, not having, you know, a more diverse looking group of people do the same thing. And that's part of the problem of the replication crisis. I saw a question about intersectionality or not, or a question about are there examples of work doing this well? And I think groups that sort of, uh, or scholarship that, that, that does not consider asymmetrical power relationships, whether in knowledge system or social identities, like the example, Jackie, that you just talked about in terms of expectations, do the scholarship a disservice even if they're in high impact journals. Okay, I am going to, you can keep the questions and responses coming, but I just want to note that in the chat, I'm going to post a um, link, a Zoom link and a passcode. This Zoom link and a passcode will take you to a kind of post presentation room if you wish to go there some of the presenters will remain in the room for a more informal kind of discussion if you want to engage with them fit sort of um in real time uh discussion question and answer and conversation uh but please um 
I just posted it. Please copy it now. There's still some time left in our session right now, but copy this now because whenever we end the webinar, the link in the passcode will go away and you won't be able to retrieve it. So copy it now and paste it somewhere so that you have it if you wish to attend that more informal discussion that will follow for 30 or so minutes after uh, this formal webinar. So we have a, um, a few minutes, Glenn. Do we want to take a final question? Sure, yes. There is a question by Syed Mohammed Omar. According to Sharzat's question, I'm wondering how a reparation-like or redistribution mechanism would like when it comes to offsetting the current dominance of Northern universities, Western journals, and the sheer number of young careerists who want to make a mark in academia. Is there anyone who would like to answer the question? Fuad, uh, Joshua, Mona, Jacqueline? Uh, sure, I can take a stab at this. Um, well, I think uh, a lot of the um, issues that we're seeing are not necessarily uh, related to a particular mechanism or a particular process or even a particular policy, but end up being emergent out of uh, the dynamics of everything that's going on. And particularly in this, this question, it occurs to me that it's uh, really a, a, an issue of the network structures that have developed, you know, historically um, that advantage uh, these kinds of journals and these kinds of institutions and uh, offsetting mechanisms. For example, some journals do um, emphasize, for example, um, um, underrepresented uh, populations uh, studied or emphasize underrepresented uh, scholars. Uh, these tend not to, uh, these do give, you know, uh, alternatives and, and, and make things a little bit easier for um, some kinds of work, but they don't compete in the same way that, uh, and, and don't have the same kinds of impact that uh, the, um, the central or core sort of um, journals or institutions in, um, in Northern or Western contexts have because they tend to be uh, by nature of their temporal and, and historical and, and um, uh, disciplinary positioning tend to be marginal even um, uh, even after they they, um, they become established. Uh, so for me, it, it seems uh, more likely that uh, approaches that kind of change the whole system of how we assign um, uh, how we assign credit, how we assign uh, uh, how, how we build teams uh, of researchers, how we study particular phenomena has to change uh, pretty radically. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss that further uh, later in, um, in, in the next uh, portion of the session, but um, even though there are some sort of short-term sort of patch patches that could be helpful in, in some ways, and they tend, they, I, in my opinion, they tend to be fairly limited in their impact. So we are uh, at the end of the session. Uh, we can have a quick response, maybe from uh, one of the other, or both of the other presentations, if you wish to make a quick response to that. Otherwise, we can move to the. I think Mona is making a um, typing into the chat directly, so we can move on to the informal conversation. If anyone would like to join us, very good. Thank you. Please remember to uh, register for the next session. I think it's. Uh, Sarah is here to say something about that, perhaps. Yes, our next webinar will be Wednesday, November 16th at 
1600 UTC. So I put the uh, link to register for that in the chat. And you can find that link as well as all the information for that webinar, our last webinar, and the links for past webinars on SPICI's webpage that's dedicated to this web series at www.spici.org backslash decolonial perspectives. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. You have the link and the passcode for the conversation that's going to continue. And also hashtag read Sarah 2022 if you want to continue on social media talking about this topic and more. So thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Thank you. Bye.